Hello Legacy listeners, my name is Jada and welcome to Legacy Live. Today we're here with humanitarian and social activists Patrick Hutchinson, Troy Davis and Richard Pascoe. Hi. Hi guys. Hello. Hello, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Welcome to Legacy guys. It's not your first visit here but it is your first time on our podcast which is live stream on Instagram. We've got a few questions for you and then we'll be getting you involved in some activities around the Eastern with members. Okay, ready? I'm ready. Yeah, yeah. Are you ready? Yeah, let's yeah. do this. Okay. okay. We've seen you lots on the news and the iconic image of Patrick carrying the far right protester is clear in my mind. Can you tell us why you decided to help him, even though there were many hateful comments and actions made during the Black Lives Matter protest? Um, well, there are a number of reasons, but the, the, I guess the first one, it was instinct. Um, I saw somebody that was in need and uh, the outcome or what would have happened possibly had I not intervened, had we not intervened, uh, would have been uh, quite ca catastrophic. So it was an instinctive thing. I decided to just like pick him up um, and carry him to safety. Um, but then, you know, when you think about the bigger picture, um, it helped to save the narrative of the, the BLM movement because as you, as you can imagine, if something would have happened to him, the papers the next day wouldn't have pulled any punches in, in what they would have uh, printed. Um, and again, also, I like to think, or we like to think that, um, you know, some young men were stopped from, you know, going uh, to prison, you know, they've been incarcerated because had we not intervened, um, that man would have, God knows how, you know, how, how badly he would have been harmed. And then the young men involved would have ended up uh, in front of the courts. And as I've mentioned previously, you know, we don't get a fair trial when it comes to uh, the courts and um, they wouldn't have looked at the events of the day and how the, we were prov provoked um, they would have just uh, sentenced them to, to sentences and so I'd like to think that in what we did we stopped that from happening That's very good to hear Can you tell us more about your organisation and what your vision for the future is? Well, I'll say a bit and then I'll let Troy, who's our managing director, jump in. But uh, for me, um, we have four pillars, um, generally that we talk about. One is education, another is mental health and well-being. We also have uh, criminal justice system reform, which includes police reform and community reform. And we have youth development. And me personally, I'm working in the education area of education. And as well as going into schools and talking to young children about you know being in the being the change in the world that we want to see and uh, you know anti anti bystander training etc um, we're also trying to set up or not even trying to we are going to set up our own uh, alternative educational provision um, and we're hoping that you know those poor children that are unfortunately uh, flown out of mainstream state schools uh, because they're having behavioral issues uh, attendance issues, issues at home that, that then transcends into their school life and causes them to be disruptive to other children. They then get thrown into the pupil referral units and then from there it's generally a downward spiral into young offenders institutions because there is a correlation. Some 70% of uh, uh, inmates in uh, young offenders institutions and prisons then end, uh, have come from uh, pupil referral units. So we're taking those children putting them into our uh, alternative education provision and finding out a little bit more about them, what it is they enjoy, what it is they're good at and trying to hone in on those skills that they have as opposed to just thrusting them into academia which some of them are just not uh, you know, very good at. Sorry. Yeah, it's like Patrick seems to have answered all the questions with myself. Mm -hmm. But yeah, Patrick's 100% right on that. The main vision for United to Change and Inspire. Um, again, it was born out of what Patrick had achieved on that day, him and the other guys. Uh, and from there, what we decided to do was to create this company because it meant a lot to us. The same way the impact of Patrick's action had an effect on the world, it had an effect on myself. So hence the reason why I'd reached out. But the vision with regards to UKI is to continue to build, to continue to work with our young people because it's important that we have something out there that will inspire the next generation. What we're aiming to do through UKI is to look at early interventions, you know, going into schools, going into nurseries, and talking to these youngsters in terms of giving them hope, the 
problem that we seem to have at the moment, a lot of the youngsters don't really have that much hope with regards to what's out there because of the difficulties and the challenges that they face. So hopefully us, ourself as an organisation and what we stand for and what Patrick and the guys have done on that day, hopefully they'll look at what we've done as some form of inspiration to take them to that next level. So it's all about planning for the future and also planning for our young people who has so much aspirations in what they want to do. So if we can help those dreams come to fruition, that's what we're aiming to do. That's really good to hear that you're helping those of young people. Well, we think you're really inspiring, but tell us who inspired you in your service. Well, thank you. Um, well, the person that had the biggest impact on me uh, back when I was younger and today is my mother, um, for numerous reasons mainly because she raised my sister and I single-handedly and, and she still takes care of us to this day in her 70s um, as well as taking care of her mum. Uh, but outside of my mum, public figures or people uh, more widely known, I'm a great Muhammad Ali fan, um, I'm a great Jack Johnson fan. Jack Johnson was the first black heavyweight champion of the world in, in the early 1900s. So look him up, really, really interesting character. Um, a big Bruce Lee fan, for those of you that are, that are into martial arts. Um, and Pele, Pele, the Brazilian footballer. I loved watching him when I was growing up. So those are some of the people that inspired me um, a lot you know, when I was growing up. And I was, I was big into something called black exploitation movies. I don't know if yeah. you know what they are, <laughs> which, uh, you know, also look that up. But there were some characters, uh, black actors back then, uh, that I like, like Jim Kelly, for example. So yeah, the people that inspired me growing up. Similar to Patrick, um, for me, my biggest inspiration again uh, was my mother. Um, my dad and mum, they were emigrated to Jamaica quite a while back, and um, dad came back to England, so my mother was a person who was always there to support myself and my siblings. And so she was a massive influence on my life. She's always said to me as a child, you know, whatever you're going through, don't let anyone see that you're struggling. Just always make sure that you keep your head up and always believe in yourself and what you wanted to do. So those things have always echoed and stayed with me as a child growing up. And when I got older, um, a lot of my teachers at my school were influential. Um, Touchwood, a um, very good teacher of mine, Chris Owen, God rest his soul. Um, he was like a father figure in, to me at the time um, at school. White teacher, amazing guy. Uh, never left out any of the youngsters in terms of you know, building and encouraging them in what they were doing. And I remember um, just by default, you know, when he passed and before he passed, all of those teachings that he gave to me growing up um, basically kind of stuck with me. So doing what we're doing for you, Kai, was important because I didn't realise at the time that what he was teaching us to look after others, doesn't matter what colour, creed or background they were from, was something that would have had a major impact on what we're doing now. So I think that was another massive influence in terms of what we did for you, Kai, because those are the things that we want to make sure that we continue to emulate and look after children and take things to the next level. So, yeah, they were people, and then obviously my brothers and my dad as well, but if I think about it, obviously Chris had a big impact on my life. Yeah. I'd actually say, I mean, my parents, I'd say, yeah, definitely inspired me because um, I mean, my parents, they either fostered or done child mind up to about, say, what, 80 kids, 89 kids throughout the years. And like, um, I had every nationality around me all the way through. So, um, I mean, my mum's about the only person I know that can give um, pork ribs to a Jewish family and, and they'll always ask them for, yeah, for those ribs. So yeah, they just mingled everybody, okay? Um, when it came to the business side of things, I had no inspiration with anybody because no one did what I did. So my inspiration was my mirror. I just looked at the mirror and said, right, I'm going to be the better version of you today. And I beat outdo myself every day. And um, because there was no one else doing what I did, I had to be the first one through the doors in a lot of things I did. So, I mean, I always use this phrase, the first one through the door gets the bullets. But I had to open the doors for a lot of other people to come through. And that's how my life was all the way through. I had to inspire myself 
do I have to do? Change the narrative, change companies, change what's happening in companies, and open the door for many people to come through and make it for themselves. So, um, yeah, I'd say my mirror is my inspiration. Me. It can be very easy to get angry, frustrated, or sad when you hear about issues of racism. Can you tell us what keeps you calm when you're stressed? Go on, someone else start. Yeah, I'll Ooh. start this time. Okay, um, what keeps me calm when I'm stressed? Activities, training, that's important to me. Um, I think in terms of addressing issues with mental health, um, waking up in the morning, I'm up, I'll say by 5, 5.30, I'm out and I'm training, um, road work. If I'm not road work, I'm out in the park, skipping, shadow boxing, doing whatever I need to do. And I think that releases the endorphins in your body. And that gives you, you know, that happy energy, which for training first thing in the morning is good because apparently continues for another eight to nine hours. So it keeps me focused, um, keeps me calm. And also um, my children, you know, they, they, yeah, they help to release the stress, even though there's time it can be stressful. But just seeing their smiling faces and, you know, what they aspire to and what they want to do, that's important to me. So, yeah. That's what de-stresses me. Yeah, I should have gone first because he stole my answers. <laughs> so, so, so yeah, training. Everybody knows that. Like, um, I'm a personal trainer and stuff. So, like, fitness uh, is a huge part of my life. Like, um, I'm quite certain that I would have had mental breakdowns at various stages in my life had I not had like training, physical fitness, and training and martial arts to help me cope. I mean, I didn't realize at the time, but now as uh, I'm older, I realize those things were, were coping mechanisms to get me through certain stages of my life. So definitely training the martial arts. My children, but I can go on further and say my grandchildren. My, my children stress me, but my grandchildren give me joy. Like, you know, like, especially the youngest ones, you know, they give me lots of joy. You know, so yeah, my, uh, my grandchildren. I tend to not get stressed. Um, I'd like to erase anything negative around me at most times. Um, I went through a big um, hospital issue for like two years. Where I was like in and out of hospital, and when I came out, I said bye to all forms of stress. In fact, I actually made phone calls to people saying, "Don't call me again because you're stressing me." Okay, I don't need you in my world. Okay, right now I'm gonna start feeling happy every single day, right? And I don't need you in my world. Simple. Bye. And it felt so good releasing it. And I, um, when it comes to the whole racism thing, being that first one through the door throughout my career, I used to get racism a lot at me straight away. I led to this, well, I just dealt with it straight away. I learned to flag it up. Like these days, people flag it up all the way down and say, oh, that's racist, that's, I said it from the get-go, okay? If I saw something was wrong or I felt a certain way, you could not tell me how I feel about myself. I would say it straight away, okay? And it just so happens that the fact that because I'm a big black guy with a brain and I'm not afraid to use it, they would call it arrogance rather than confidence. I'm confident in what I do. And basically, if I'm saying something to you, right, um, I'm, I'm saying it this way, and if I'm saying I'm feeling so way by myself, I mean it and take what I'm saying. You can say it these days. We've had meetings, what, last year? It's like to companies and they're saying, oh, people are flagging these things up. I've been flagging it up for years. Now I feel like, okay, it's good that everyone's sort of caught up with the mindset of just saying when something's wrong. Okay, don't hide how you feel about yourself. Okay, because that can actually give you a lot of mental stress, a lot of um, hatred, a lot of, a lot of things, basically. Like, keep it inside sometimes. So I've learned to just let out all forms of stress and that way you be at peace with yourself that way through. So what message would you give to young people who want to help others like you have? Just go and, I mean the thing is like, you don't need to think about helping somebody. Patrick never thought about picking the person up at that time. He just went, it was instinct. Okay, so you don't need to think, oh, what should I do to try and help a person? Just, you can see sometimes what a person wants sometimes. You can see a family member, you can see a friend. Just communicate. Sometimes people are afraid to communicate with others, right? They'll communicate with people in their own sort of little circle, their own little bubble. Sometimes come out of that bubble and speak to somebody. You don't know what you can get from that person, right? I, I've been the, um, the only person on a shipping boat in the Arabian Sea with a bunch of Pakistani uh, fishermen fishing for crabs and lobsters at one o'clock in the morning. They speak Punjabi, I don't speak Punjabi, but I was in that circle there. And I thought to myself, wow, I'm actually exploring and learning from other people and talking to other people. And they felt so good, I was actually coming out there and learning from their culture too. 
communicate with everybody and like see who wants help, who needs help. Right? So when people say, Oh, I would never go to Pakistan, I say, listen, there's some great place over there. You wanna go here, see this, see that, they need help with this. I go to countries and I bring my clothing and just give clothing to people sometimes because I'm like, well, I've got things in abundance, so I'll go and give to people, right? Um, I tend to not like give, like throw money into charity and say, right, that's it, and walk away. I'm the person who's like, no, 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 send me there. So I've gone to places like Malawi in Africa and like developed a radio station out there and years later I've seen them come back and say, what you did out there was so amazing that basically we've got, we want to do more things with you now, years down the line. So you don't know what you're going to do by just helping one person. Okay, so just just put yourself out there, communicate, and just be that helpful person. You don't have to think about it. What do you guys think? Yeah, I was gonna, I'd say similar to what Richard said. Um, I don't tend to think about it. Like, it's almost like something that's sort of an innate value that you have within you. Like hopefully, if you've had the right upbringing, you know you'll know right right from wrong and, and, and good from bad. And uh, when people are in need, you're able to, to, to reach out and help them. Um, I like to use this saying, like, um, be the change in the world that you want to see. So if you want a, a world where we're all, you know, we all take care of one another, we all look out for one another, um, then it starts with us. You know, and if we all did that, the world would change overnight. Yeah, echoing what both guys have said, um, if you want to receive anything, you have to give it abundantly. So if you want love, you have to give love. If you want compassion, you give compassion. If you want support, you give support. That's how it all should be. And I think, you know, if that's the methodology that you apply just in life, you know, the world would be a better place. And I think, you know, where we are children, for instance, they mimic what they see. So those are the groundings that you want to set from a very early stage so that it would just become automatic for young mm -hmm. people to be doing that. Because if that's what they've seen, I know there's time it can be a very cruel world, but the only way you can make a change is to try to be the difference, to be different from somebody else. And that can create like a, a ripple effect. So if you want to help, just help. Just do it. Don't even think about it. Also, another thing, when you've got to help, don't expect things back. Too many people expect all the time, I'm doing this for you, so I expect this back. Just do it. You never know what's going to happen, just do it. But don't expect things to come back because it doesn't always work that way. Right. What do your children or grandchildren think about you being social activists and all the work that you do? Well, first of all, social activists. Uh, what do you call yourself that? Um, I don't mind the title. You know, I, I don't mind. Um, I use the word activist quite, quite frequently. Um, really, I mean, it sounds quite extreme, activist. Yeah. But to be honest, it just means people who are. Striving or fight, <laughs> fighting for change, you know, you know, equality and all that, all that good stuff. So that's all they really mean. Um, my children, um, they are quite excited. Like when I first came into the media spotlight, um, I brought them on an interview, one of the BBC interviews, and I've sort of tried to, you know, keep them out of it, the spotlight, which they're not happy about. But you know, it's for their own good. Um, but because I've been like, like really busy these last 18 months, um, now they're not so happy that I'm sort of well known <laughs> because I'm a hands-on daddy and I, I take them everywhere and do everything with them and now I, I'm not been able to do it as much as I as I used to and they're not too happy about it. So so yeah, they did start out really excited about it but they're not so excited now. <laughs> um, for myself, I'm not really in the spotlight. I, I, I really like to sit at the back um, at the end of the day, you know, trying to manage the company and looking at the vision of where the company wants to be uh, and that kind of take precedence. So I kind of leave the, the headline to Patrick who's doing a phenomenal job. So uh, yeah, that's, we leave that to Patrick. I'd actually say my daughter's a bigger star than I am anyway, so she's um, talking about social content and everything for the last few years and like um, she's known for that all over the place. So I'm just doing, she's doing what I do, I do what she does. <laughs> okay, we, we, we like to make changes. We don't, we don't follow fashion, we set the trends. You know what I, mean? um, I would always say only dead fish go with the flow. So yeah, we're always making changes ourselves. But we're proud of each other. I think when we saw um, she went down to Brixton um, um, Village yeah. after we'd done the Stephen oh, Lawrence yeah, yeah. and she just came back from America and she walked in and she looked up. She's like, and she called Dad. 
I've seen a big picture of you in Brixton Village. <laughs> you just walked in here. And that's for the Stephen Lawrence campaign. And because I never told her, because we're always doing these things. And once you've done one thing, you're on to the next thing. And that's how this whole thing has been for years. Like, this is happening, that's happening. It's like a roller coaster right now. So you've got no chance to tell people what's going on. It's just there. But um, yeah, we're proud of each other. So, Troy, you're the brand specialist and managing director of UK. And you've also done a lot of youth development and mentoring. What got you interested in youth mentoring? Actually, I've been... Good question, great question. Um, what got me interested in mentoring? I think I've been doing it for quite a while. Um, apart from working with UKI, I'm also a managing director for a brand design agency called Interscope Productions Limited. And I'm also chairman for a football club. Uh, I've been doing that for at least 30 plus years. So I'm mentoring young men and work with young women. I've been doing that for many years. Um, so the mentoring side, again, what I touched on before with regards to my teacher being such a massive influence in my life, um, I think it just happened by default. And I thought, you know, from what he had done and obviously family members and my brothers and dad as well have contributed to my upbringing, I thought it's important to give back. I think whilst someone has guided you, for a certain point of your life, I think it's imperative to do the same, to pass those trades on, because the way our life works, you know, with young people, is that the young people have the energy to do so much, but they don't necessarily have the knowledge to understand what they can do to take it to that other level. So being an older head, it's important just to pass some of those skill sets on, to uplift them and to take them to that next level. So. Mentoring was always important to me. It's always important to give back. Uh, and I think, you know, if we can do that just generally in life, to continue to raise the bar for the next generation, and then the next generation raise it even higher, that's how we continue to grow. So I think it's a part of, it should be a part of everyone's life to be able to contribute and mentor. Richard, you're a DJ for producer, photographer, and a lot more. And I've read that you share all your knowledge with young people. Can you tell us more about this? Well, I could share. I, mean, I do share. I've, uh, I've been running courses for the last 10 years in regards to get people into media. Because as I said, I had no one to actually train me or open the door or show me the right way, the wrong way. I had to basically make those mistakes myself. And about 10 years ago, um, a partner of mine, Jasmine Dutterwala, um, called me in regards to setting up a program with um, the Media Trust and it was like a program, like a, twice a year we ran it to get young people into media because they said there's not enough diversity in media so rather than talk about, oh there's not enough diversity forget talking about it, do something about it and the course we ran was like say um, 12 weeks, twice a year um, and we'll train them up on every aspect of media have them have top mentors from various companies uh, we'll work with every top company from Google, BBC um, Facebook, Snapchat, um, Sky, right across the board, um, advertising agencies that works. So if you want to get to media, it's like the quickest shortcut. And I don't forget one person at Google one time, he said, um, you should get to media, you need to know somebody. He said, now you know somebody. And that was so powerful, I thought, oh my gosh, I just realised, yeah, because like, now you're in Google, you're meeting people, you're not just pressing Google on your phone, you're meeting people working there. And a lot of these companies, like say, um, especially digital companies, they overpay you so you're happy, right? And I'm like, I'm like, wait, guys, you've got all this at your head right now, you, you've got a chance to get these companies. So the more I train them, I've got people in BBC now working there as producers. I can go to Sky, there's people working there. Go to ITV, Jeremy Vine Show, the floor manager's one of my ex-students. There's um, some that have written books. I mean, it, it puts a smile on my face when I see they've actually gone to that level and all they needed was that chance. I suppose, I suppose it goes back to my mum by fostering and child minding all these different kids and giving them chances from years ago. I mean, even now they live in America and like um, they're still like the nanny from England, homies, okay? So um, they love all that factor. And um, I suppose I've continued that. My mum said to me straight, you've continued all of um, what I put in place. And I love training people up. I will not start, stop training people. Um, the only people I don't train really are people of my age because I think they're too stubborn. Right, um, and you start to find that a lot of times when you look at your own circle, you think, Yeah, these people know they think they know a bit too much, but the young people they're like sponges, 
right? They soak up information so much and they just want that chance. And if I go back to when I was younger, when I wanted to have that chance, oh, you're too young, you're too young, you're too young. I would never say to a young person, you're too young. Give them that chance. Because at the end of the day, think of all the digital companies, they were made by young people, right? And they're most lucrative companies right now. So empower young people, that's my whole thing. Last set of questions, guys. These are quick fire questions, and you just have to say the first thing that comes to your mind. So, first one, favorite comfort food. Favorite comfort food. <sighs> what is on my plate? Um, <laughs> I'm gonna go for um, car salted caramel Hagen Dazs. Patty. And if you tie as well. <laughs> Dream holiday destination. Has to be the same, yeah. <laughs> Thailand. 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 Jamaica. <laughs> Thailand. <laughs> Favourite song right now? Oh gosh. I'm going to go for Essence Whiskey. Is it Essence? Yeah. You say songwriter or song? Song. Song. You said song. How are you going to ask a DJ for it? That's the worst question to ask a DJ. Songwriter. Songwriter. Okay. Okay. I say Wayne Hexer. Wayne Hexer. Because I signed him. Mm. Hey, <laughs> Only one I know. <laughs> Only one you know who ain't Nectar. <laughs> I ain't keeping it for real. <laughs> Alison Tennant, sorry, Alan. Favourite TV show or movie? TV show? I'd say box. anything 50 Cent is doing right now. It's All the 50 Cent shows. Oh, TV show. Movie, I'm going to go for, I've got so many, but I'm just going to go for Friday. Yeah, with Chris Tucker. That's, that's the first one. Yeah. Nice cube. Yeah, the first and one. Comedy, and I love to laugh. Ooh, I'm gonna get on. Like, movies the Swiss. TV show. Seven. TV show. I did love um, Game of Thrones in terms of series and that. Yeah, I loved that. Like how it ended. Not really. Yeah. But, but but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna hold that against. No no. When somebody's about love... tasting enough, that means it's done. No no. I still loved it. No, no, I still no. loved the whole thing. You, 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 it's you, how it's how you leave people. And breaking, at the end of the day. And breaking Bad. I loved Breaking, breaking Bad. Breaking Bad was good. Yeah. I'm sorry. I, I can't add to this. So <laughs> I've bad. got too much work to do for you. <laughs> all, he, all he's hearing is. <laughs> <laughs> My time is you kite out. So I ain't got time to watch TV. <laughs> Favorite sport. Football. I say motor racing, my mum got me into it. Way before Lewis. I think to watch, to watch is between boxing and football. And mixed martial arts, boxing and football, to watch, to partake in, has to be martial arts. Yeah, right. yeah, my Say Thai boxing, for example. At the same time, mum screwed me over. Because right. what she did, right? I got into scare metrics, they brought me one to track it every year. And that present lasted me for 15 years. Mine's crafty. <laughs> Seriously. Thank you so much for coming, and that's the end of the podcast. But we'll be meeting some young people around Legacy. Thank you, you're amazing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.